Guys, welcome to Oak Shape YouTube. This is Josh Jones with the Mohawk. Quarantine hairstyle. Uh, so he wanted to take precious reps away from me because I was going to do the bow build. And he was like, no, 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 no. I'm doing the bow build. So Josh is doing the 28 build on the rattle can job. And why we're doing this and showing you guys a cool bow build and what he does and how he does it because you guys are asking. I'm going to try to find some of those YouTube questions and uh, go from there. Talk us through everything. I'm going to step out of frame. I'm going to run the next camera, guys. We're going to have Josh just build and talk while we do this. And this is going to be a fun bow build here at Spokane Valley Archery. So first things first, we're setting square for our soft knots. So we need to get an arrow in here and set the level height so we know where the soft knots belong. I like to use a square to start just to get an idea of where it needs to go. So we need an axis sized arrow. Brought, That'll work. I brought my arrows too. If you want. Uh, grab one of yours. That's ideal, but that's height-wise what we're looking for. Do you sell that clamp you just put on? Uh, yeah, I actually make this jig. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, you guys asked about that. I said they're fifty bucks. Fifty bucks. Yeah, it's it's magnetic instead of clamp. There's a one out there that you screw down and tighten, but mine's just got a magnet on it, so it comes on and off really easily. It's a good way to get where your level's at. Um, give me an arrow, please. Just that one's fine. Thanks. Okay, so level. Let's move that forward just a scotch. Level, level. Those silver marks are perfect 90, so we're good. With where those are positioned can take that off take that off we'll go back and level the side after we get that set Bring that around here this is just getting some beeswax on the soft knot material what's your thoughts on one soft knot on just the bottom uh versus two soft knots uh, both just seems like a little more security jigs not holding it should so i don't think it's going to hurt to uh to have two, you just gotta plan for it. When you're tying your not your loop, you're gonna end up with a longer loop length material to make it work out right. If you do that, so, that's the only thing there. One soft knot's okay. I just if you're gonna make one, you might as well make two. But you also gotta be pretty convinced that where you're putting it's where you want it, because if you end up having to change from it. You're gonna end up cutting them out. How just can't really move you it. Right now, pretty solid. Um, if I had never built one of these before, I would probably not put tie my soft knots in right out of the gate and just make sure that square is correct on the bow. Because at the end of the day, if you've got a different bow and it doesn't quite have a perfectly level knock travel, you still got to try to get it to tune somewhat, and you may end up changing your knock height out of perfect 90. But most every one of these that I've built is a perfect 90. What's the deal with knock tuning? Getting a lot of people asking about knock tuning. Knock tuning as in what? Couldn't tell you. A lot of comments on the tubes about knock tuning. Do you guys ever knock tune? Why don't you knock tune? What is knock tuning? Is my question to them. So knock tuning, I was hoping you it makes sense to you. Um, I guess is it's probably a different terminology than I'm familiar with for something. Um, Okay. Um, people are asking about feathers because they're lighter. Sure. What's your thoughts on that? Hope it don't rain. You, uh, you can waterproof feathers. And if you waterproof feathers, that'll help, but they'll lose their flexibility. They'll be real rigid and stiff still, typically. At least all the waterproofing stuff that I ever played with seem to be that way. But... Um, I like feathers a lot actually. They're just not super durable at high velocities. So if you don't mind refletching your arrows a lot and you don't mind putting waterproof on them, feathers might not be a bad way to go. Have you seen the company like, um, gosh dang it, Fob is one of them? Yeah. As far as the Fob stuff what, or stuff like that, what you, what's your thoughts? Well, I'll be completely honest. I played with those a little while back, probably five, six years back. I think it's a reasonable concept. My bigger concern with it is as soon as I tried to use one, 
the fob, unless they changed it, is at the back of the arrow. It's right here, right, right where the knock is. And the problem with that is it adds a circumference of you know roughly five eighths of an inch, half inch, around the back end of the arrow. And when you go to draw back, that's sitting against the side of your face, so you can no longer bring your head upright and square to it when your arrow comes back here. You'd have to lean your head over to look through it. Makes for a very awkward anchor point. And at the end of the day, my anchor point's where my consistency comes from more than anything that I can actually do it the same that makes it more difficult to do it the same. So at that point, I stopped playing with it. I was like, nope, if I can't have a normal, regular old anchor point that I find to be duplicatable and consistent, I'm not going to do it. So uh, do they work? Yes. Is it relatively accurate? Yes. But until they you know, move it forward two inches on the shaft or whatnot, I, I can't see me oh, using it, to be honest. Talk to us. Um Tell everybody why we chose to go natural with green serving. Natural has no dye in it and no pigment. So this is the color of the string material before anything ever happens to it. So this is in its most natural, God, I keep dropping stuff, natural state, which is why it's called natural. The color from the strings comes from the wax dye that they put in it that changes it. So in essence, you are making a product when it's colored that is more likely to give stretch or change. So because of that, we, are re we recommend natural over anything. And then we started just buying different colored servings so you can still have a color accent of some choice, but you're getting the most durable material you can possibly have. Hence the natural. So that's 454 natural. You want a bright green? Of course I do. Loop. All right. What about low profile veins? A lot of questions about low profile veins. Get that, they want to get that fourth vein on there any way they can. Well, you can put, use a low profile vein. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, my belief on profile is you have to ask yourself, where are you benefiting? What's helping you with a low profile vein? Uh, if the purpose of a low profile vein is to get better clearance off of your riser or your arrow rest, I'd start looking at what bow you're shooting and what arrow rest you're using if you have to maintain better clearance over those things. I would question why. Every bow should be designed today, if it's tuned in the right spot and square in the right spot, that it has at least 5 eighths to 3 quarters of an inch clearance in any direction. And that's a blazer or taller than a blazer. So what, what is the purpose? If you're saying I want to shoot by a, a bushel of branches 25 yards downrange when my animal's 50 yard downrange and don't want to nick it, then I get it. I understand. If you're saying I want less lateral surface area for the wind purpose when wind's blowing at distance, I get that and understand that. But if you're using a low profile vein, I would believe at that point you're going to have to use a longer vein to achieve the stability. You're still going to have the same wind resistance change. So it doesn't matter if it's short and tall or long and skinny, it's still surface area per surface area. And once again, if you go to putting four veins on instead of three, there's greater surface area from the side while it rotates. So are you really gaining or not? The only way to truly prove that is to test it, shoot it at distance in the wind, one via the other. And so our, our video of you know challenging the three for four, go build those. Make three arrows with four fletches and a wrap and a two degree to three degree helical and then make three arrows with three fletches and a max helical, like a five, six degree that that jig will do and shoot them both at distance. You tell me which one's more accurate. You'll find it. So low profile is going to be a little less stable, typically, with the same wind drift purpose. Because once again, you're trying to twist the fletch. If you're twisting the fletch, using lower profile you're probably using longer but it's a it's kind of a, a double hinted question to be honest because you I need more information are we talking a two inch low profile vein it's probably not gonna stabilize a broadhead they just typically won't even if you put a good amount of twist on it it's very challenging and very hard to do cool. Did you see on my bow build where I went through the little parts? I went through that. 
on the cable. I just loosened those up and went through that. No. Yeah. What? Where'd you go through? You know uh, this for the limb. Oh, the the yeah. actual thing. Yeah, I yeah. loosened that up and just slid that the cable under on Jake Webb's. Yeah. Bow. Yeah. What's your thoughts on that? I guess. I don't think it's gonna hurt anything, and a lot of that depends on what you're tying to get it through there and loop it. Like I'll do it with this. That's no problem. I was quite a stir. Why would you compare a four fletch right offset to a three fletch left helical? Especially when you already know your arrows are naturally rotating left off the string. Because it doesn't you'll, achieve, you'll come up with the same thing. If you do it right or left, it won't matter. It's the why amount of pitch and the amount of twist. Because one guy said that when well, I did it, it I built, tears differently. I built four arrows today. I built three arrows today. Three degree offset to the left, four fletch. Because I have that video. Because you said we're going to make another 365 prep. So I was going to address it and be like, here, I made it. Let's test it. Yeah. So cool. Don't, don't, put, don't, come don't put heat on Josh for that. Uh, well, no, first off, I, I totally get that. But. Well, then not ask I don't. I, I am. I am not saying that clocking your arrows and fletching your arrows is going to make it more accurate, at all. It's going to make it bleed less energy, because the arrow is naturally trying to turn to the right. I don't believe it's making it any more accurate, because the amount of pitch and the appropriate the appropriate spine and the appropriate build of the arrow versus the bow is what's going to dictate accuracy in how well it's going to group, but. Right helical versus left helical isn't going to make you more accurate. It's simply going to make it more efficient. Efficiency and accuracy are not the same thing. The other concern was helical ballooning out at long yardages. Test it. What do you... What do so, you so all right, so helical ballooning out at longer yardages versus more fletchings and more drag? Because, I mean, if you put four fletchings on an arrow, that's more surface area that the wind is going to hit. So... Three fletches, less surface area, more twist, yes, more rotation. But once an object gets going in motion, it typically will remain in motion. So it's not creating more force for that helical to drop farther. But hey, test it. Take your arrow that weighs with an extra fletch, another eight grains, because each fletch weighs roughly eight grains. So your arrow is now eight grains heavier. And tell me if more helical with three fletches drops more than less helical with four fletches on a heavier arrow. What what kind of drop might we see if it was three fetch versus three fletch with maybe like one degree of offset versus four or five? That's uh, a little too far down the math path to actually say an exact number. It'd be something I'd just simply go test it. Mm -hmm. I'd build it, go out and test it and see what the drop difference was, which that's a static easy thing for somebody to build. Um, will helical drop a little more than a slight offset, everything else being equal? Sure. It takes more force to get that arrow moving because it's turning at a higher rate. But once it continues to move, it's gliding. But you're not going to lose downrange accuracy, let's say at like 100 yards. You're just going to With see a little more With more helical, drop. you're going to increase your accuracy at 100 yards. Especially in instances where you nick something as it's leaving the bow because it's spinning faster, which means it will recover faster. So to go back to a perfect spin sooner. If it's rotating slower and you hit something, it, the rotation is what corrects those things. So the faster it rotates, the quicker it's going to get to the middle. Same variance as an imperfect broadhead, for example. If your broadhead isn't zeroed 100% perfectly straight out of the shaft, it's got like one degree of turn to where it wobbles a little bit. The faster your arrow turns, the faster it will correct that variance. And the tighter your group will be. And I've seen it over and over and over again. So, okay, so that looks good there. Let's get our level back on here. Okay, so your first axis is good and level. And if you had to adjust not. it? If you had to adjust it, you would loosen this screw and that screw and then turn that screw right there. Right where my fingernail is to drive it left or right. Well, and honestly, you people get really hung up on the chronograph. You don't need it. It's not, a lot of guys it's not nearly as relevant as a paper tuner, for example. It's not really nearly as relevant as even a uh, arrow straightness gauge, being able to see the spin on your tips to see if they're straight. I mean, none of those things are nearly as relevant. Someone commented that why don't we use Archer's Advantage like they were 
Like, we had never heard of Archer's Advantage. Like, Josh doesn't have Archer's Advantage right here, right now. No, I, I don't, and there's a reason for that. We've had it for years. Uh, you know why? We used it. It's Yeah, you know why, right? Uh-uh. How many times did I have to reprint you a tape? All the time. Why? Cause because of the monkey fire in the bow. Yeah. So why am I going to put a program yeah. that gets down to the exact half a yard yeah. when the yep. information you give it? So a uh, buddy of mine, Doug, who teaches me rifle stuff, has a very good analogy when it talks about the information that you put into a computer program. Garbage in, garbage out. If you put bad information in there, it's going to give you bad results. Yep. If you don't give it exact mark variances to the gnat's ass, it's going to be wrong. And then you're going to come back five days later and tell me how wrong it is. And then I get to redo it. And in your mind, it's my fault that it's wrong. It's like, no, this is what you gave me. Yeah. And that's what I gave you is the information based off of that. So if people want Arch's Advantage, I strongly encourage them to buy it and use it because it is a very accurate program. But you're not going to do it once and have it right. You're going to go out and shoot it. And then three days later, you're going to shoot it again. And then three days later, you're going to shoot it again. You're going to realize it's off a little bit and you need to redo it. Yeah. And that's not an, a service that I will provide, especially with not all these sites come with site tapes for the most part. They all come with a you know, 30 different pre-generated site tapes. So you can make whatever you want and change it however you want. So be, once they started doing that, I didn't buy it again. Because the computer I had it on was the direct licensee of it. And I would have had to pay to have it again. So I have uh, site tape programs for my own use, but I won't print off them. A guy should have that. If you're trying, if you're trying to shoot 100 yards, like consistently, you need to own that because you're going to need to be able to accurately print a tape that is specifically critiqued for you, and that program is necessary to do it. But you should own it and buy it yourself, and not just make it for someone else. Okay, so our level's good there, and since this is a shootable third access site, we're not going to set that. We're going to shoot that later. Got some, got some uh, pushback from like an actual couple archery shop owners that sure. they thought I was promoting like do it yourself 100% uh, when I got into the last chance archery easy green and the vice and so obviously I felt like I've explained myself like I just want to learn more and I want to be able to do it at my house. I don't want to drive all over here. And I have you guys for when I screw things up inevitably and come back. But what's your thoughts on guys buying a bow press and working on some other stuff and getting acquainted? You're a pro shop owner. Does that offend you or are you down for that? What's your thoughts? Um, I'll, I'll be honest on that one. A long time ago, I was probably avoiding the same sort of things. I didn't want people to work on their own gear because I felt like it directly affected me financially. Um, but after experiencing it for a little while and always, you know, upgrading my bow presses to something different, I'd have, end up selling off my bow presses. And my experience with that is when a guy bought a bow press, he ended up tinkering with his bow more and so much more that you ended up working on his bow more often than you used to because he kind of screwed it up and couldn't figure it out and is trying to learn. Um, there are things today that re kind of require you to need a press to be able to truly tune your bow perfectly. And I would much rather you understand your bow fully to make you a better archer because if you're a better archer you're more successful with it you're more likely to get more people in the sport which is in turn going to create more revenue for my store because they're going to buy gear and things of that nature so i can't look at every individual as only one transaction i've got to look at the long-term success and progress of the sport and if we're making better archers in this area because we're not afraid of that um, I think it's all better in the long run. There's just simply going to be more archers. So I think to truly be great with your gear, you have to be able to work on it. And to try to hinder someone's ability to do that, to me, is just is not what's in the best interest of the long-term growth of the sport. People are going to work on their stuff whether you like it or not and whether you help them or not. It's just a matter of if they blow it up in the process or you at least get them through it somewhat so they understand it a little better. My upper echelon archers in this area I have harped on for the better part of a decade saying you have to understand how to work on your bow. I appreciate you coming in and giving me your patronage but you have to understand how this works or you're not going to be able to understand how to fix something that's going wrong. You're not going to be able to identify what the problem is. You're only saying, hey, it doesn't work right, fix it. So to me, I, I want to make everybody better regardless of whether that's in my immediate area or long term. 
if we're all better, we're, the sport will get better, more people will get in the sport. Simple as that. So to me, financially, it, that's not the better goal. The better goal is to make the sport better and people that are in it better. So that's my two cents on it, and that's my philosophy. And I will say that my philosophy changed five to ten years ago because I felt a similar way. It's like, well, but then I didn't get to charge you for working on your bow. It's like, well, yeah, you probably are actually still going to charge a person to work on their bow because they're going to tinker with it more and, you know, struggle to remember what to do. But the better you make them, the better off we're all going to be. Great answer, man. Okay, so we've got uh, a leveled sight. We've got a good rest position. We've got a loop on here that's good. Uh, Dan, we're going to need your release. So some of the questions guys had was uh, where to put the rest off the riser. A lot of manufacturers have their specs listed, i.e. 13, 16 or whatever. Yep. Some guys were asking 15, 16. What's your answer for the guys wondering where to put it through the burger button and how so, far off the riser? If we're just giving a generic answer to that and not each specific bow and each specific setup. Generic answer is 13, 16 off the riser and dead center of the burger hole is generic height. Um, and if you have to move it more than, say, an eighth inch out of those specs, there's probably something greater going on that you shouldn't just move your rest around uh, in general. But um, as a base guideline, it's 13 sixteenths and uh, off the riser and right through the burger hole. Some bows will tune and shoot better a little, a little through the higher portion of the burger hole. Some will tune a little better through a lower portion of the burger hole, but either way you slice it, it should be roughly in the burger hole somewhere because that's where the, the balance and the hand pressure versus where you're attaching to the string because these two aren't even with each other. This is well below where your hand is, so if the bow is designed a particular way with a particular height, if you get too high above that point or too low below that point, it doesn't want to point at the target. It wants to bump up and down, and they're designing that based off of these relations of where those are to where the variance in here is depending on the manufacturer. So that's why you're trying to stay near the burger hole because the manufacturer designed it to point better with that position in mind. But you can move it up and down and still get it to tune. Doesn't mean it won't tune. Just bringing it up a little bit. Cause it looked like it was a tiny bit low and the paper showed it was a little low. Um, and I checked the timing already and it's perfect. So that should alleviate our up and down. And I mean, bring it back just a tiny bit. But we're all within a real safe realm of it working correctly. Can you run the part for All right, I'm gonna tune it again. Textbooky. How hard to pull this thing back? It feels like a lot, man. I didn't scale it, but, oh. <laughs> but it's harder because it's stopping so much earlier. It, might, it hurts my shoulder to do that. Ooh. Oh boy! The physical joint pop. So clear. We can move that. It's a little smaller. We'll bring that back just a skittish. Oh, will, you, will you point at those? Yeah, yeah. So we're gonna say that that is a uh, point left. Point low left. Point low left. This is what we want. That's what we're getting consistently. And I'm here to tell you, I have never pulled that bow back. Dude, that thing's 80 pounds. I, I have 75 pound maws in there. He must have twisted those strings extra, extra, extra tight. We gotta put it in a scale. If it's more than 75 pounds, I wouldn't be surprised. If it's not, I need to hit the weight room tonight. All right. You needed. Um, separately, and I just assumed glue wasn't going to work. 
but in reality, it was actually I just needed to use their. It's a pain in the butt. Yeah, it's it works on a solid surface, but you get those bubbles in there, and it doesn't tend to want to go right. Uh, do we not put the prices up to get curiosity? We will. The squat. Oh, I... My nephew Riley is going to steal one of your guys' job. I don't know who. Ben. When he's 16, I'm... 14, and is that more or less than the words in his vocabulary? No, he's, no, he's stupid smart. I, he's annoying smart. Is that common sense or is that smart? We got books, lots of books. book smart? Book smart. Inserts. Okay, I'll bump you a little bit and we'll be good. See if that does it. There you go. Yay! Bow, bow, bow. Brown chicken, brown cow. That's how views. So what do you like about that feet? Me or Dan? Dan. He's the one using it. I don't know, dude. I didn't like it last year, if you remember. I don't know if you actually I'm going uh, I'm going back to a, a rad because they make glow in the dark ones. Yeah, and that's not so you can shoot it in the dark, it's so you can shoot in a blind and low light and you'll still be able to see your peep. Oh. Okay. More than that? Put your nose back down there. That's pretty good. Yeah. Maybe up yeah, a so smidge. Yeah, so most things are going to be drop off, so like if we have to tune your bow and stuff like that, it's probably going to be a drop off. And yeah, that's it. Awesome. Hey, Brandon! There, Brandon, there are four tires in the back of my truck. I'd like you to get them out of the back of my truck and put them by the Connex. Okay. Thank you. I don't want to take them home. Yeah, you'll be ruined. You'll be ruined with her. My little girl. She knows. That's easy. Maybe I'll drop my phone. What's your release? In my pocket. There's a lot of bows. Yeah, but that's how we bow. I was thinking of stealing some boxes from two. here. But they got two. It just what? They got two. See, you should rotate. Yeah, it should be good. Amy, I, I, I should be. Came back good the first time, and orientation looks about right. You should be good. Do you want to talk through the um, spray paint job? I need a sharpie to piss out of this, actually. Okay. That's a good thing to film. Drawing on everything that would move, basically. That's touching. I want that a little higher. So your happy point on this quiver, Dan, is where it's flush right here. Do not move it in past that. Roger. And that's your orientation line in the back. There, that's a good height there. So you're silver sharpening anything that could and can and would move? Anywhere that can feasibly functionally move. Let's see here. Yes, down here. 
Come here for a second. Um, you can uh, you can get really elaborate with it. You can go on to like eBay and buy a graphic kit where you can actually paint layers on it and actually get different designs to pop through it. And it's relatively easy and you can do that rattle can. Um, I'm more of a fan of actually just doing the riser and taping it off like it would be done in the factory to where you'd cover your graphics up, take your handle off, disassemble the bow and then just paint the riser and put it back together and then everything else is still the colors that it was. But if you're trying to make the most muted thing you can get and get rid of any reflective surface, you'd do this. You'd cover everything with a flat paint like Dan did here. And from a hunting standpoint, as far as it being hard to see or make out or reflect, it's exactly what he did. Josh, give the people a preview. Are they gonna get to see your rig in 2020? Yes, absolutely. When I'm finished tuning it and I'm satisfied with it, I'm playing with a different arrow at the moment. It's not quite done yet, but I'd say within the next month, I'll be complete on it. So yeah, I'll absolutely go within over Within 60 no days from when this video comes. <laughs> yeah, assuming you guys are around to come video. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, but that's Dan's 28. Everything's marked and ready to roll. This thing can go kill something. Do you want him to like chop through the steps real quick? Like, I mean, recap it. Like and a recap. Yep. Yeah. Just a recap, basically. 60 overview. seconds or less. Well, we set our loop pipe, put in our soft knots, got everything squared up there, set it with levels. Once that was solid, we set the sight with levels. Had already set our timing, went through, ran it through paper, realized our wheeling wasn't quite perfect, so we had to reshim the cam assembly. Got that all done, got our tear back where it's perfect, then had Dan fire it, made a couple small tweaks there, got it perfect, set his P pipe, tied it in place. This thing's about as perfect as it can be, and when I was satisfied with everything from a tune standpoint, I went through and marked everything, so I knew if you moved it or if something shifted, you knew where it was. I, I, Marked where the rest movements are here, where the rest movements are there, where it matches with the riser if it ever rotated, where your quiver positions sit in relation to the sight, where the quiver positions are here if you ever moved it up and down. So if any of this stuff ever came loose or ever moved, we knew right where it was and could easily move it back and then finished it off by marking the cams in relation to where the cables are. So if, God forbid, your cables ever stretch, it's pretty easy to go put back your timing where it was because these little indicator holes are a starting point, but they're not a finishing point. You'll almost always find that one of them's a little advanced from the other, and you need to identify where that is. So this one is a little different than that one, and now I can look at it and tell exactly where it goes. So if you, Dan comes in here three months from now and hands me this bow, I know exactly where to put it. It'd take me a couple minutes. Be easy.